normally used to think of uh, space as um, a couple of things. One is the space that surrounds us, uh, the house, the street, the office. And then there's the space of the scientist, uh, the space of stars and mysterious physics. The truth is that uh, we are really living in a third kind of space. It's not a space of Newton and Einstein. It's not just the space of my house, your place, the cinema, the pub, the restaurant. It's also the space made of information. When I'm on Facebook, when I use YouTube, uh, when I spend time reading tweets, where am I? Well, I'm in this special space that I label the infosphere. So it's a sphere, a bit like the biosphere, uh, so the area of the world where life uh, can uh, flourish, but it's made of information. Now, what difference does it make to spend so much time in the infosphere? Well, maybe two points are important to stress. One, compared to other mass media, we live in the infosphere, in cyberspace, online. Whereas when you watch TV or when you are listening to the radio or going to the cinema or reading a newspaper, you don't live on the newspaper or on TV. So this really is a new space, a new environment. And because it is a new environment, it has huge intersections, interactions and consequences for the other environments, especially the ordinary one, my house, your office, the street. So think in terms, for example, of security or business. We used to go to the bank. Today, we don't go to the bank anymore. We bank online. Again, we visit a virtual space and we do what we need to do interacting with a bank without moving from our house. Where am I? In the infosphere, banking or security. It's not just a matter of uh, closing the windows or making sure that there's an alarm. It's also a matter of who has access to my data online in the infosphere. And so the infosphere is now the space where we spend a lot of time and more time and where we are changing most of the things that we do ordinarily. Education, health, security, interaction, jobs and so on. There are many benefits but also shortcomings. Uh, in uh, a life spent increasingly among agents that are slightly artificial in an environment that is increasingly made of information. Some of the benefits are obvious. Convenience, efficiency, the ability to reach almost any corner of the world just one click away, the possibility of buying anything if you have the money uh, because it's available there in the catalogue of the world. It doesn't depend on which village you are from or which city you live in. So all these benefits, conveniences, a uh, much easier life, a potentially richer life in terms of culture, in terms of information, in terms of uh, relations. Well, all that is counterbalanced, unfortunately, by shortcomings. There are some risks. For example, fragility. All these systems are easily attacked and could put a whole nation on its knees. There's also the ability that we have or wasting so much time maybe watching cats on Facebook. So it's not just a matter of uh, reading the New York Times or being more informed about the last elections. And uh, there's also a huge inequality building up in the background because those who have created this infosphere and this space of information for us are also the ones who are essentially taking most advantage economically from the new business. That risk, that shortcoming, is something that we can do something about, socially speaking. Not yet, but hopefully in the future. So our life in the infosphere, or what I've called in the past this on life, which is a mix between being online and offline, is it irreversible? Probably. Not because we have no alternative, we have no choice, but because it's very difficult. It's a uh, unlikely. Uh, the whole world is moving towards this life in the infosphere, on life, being connected and at the same time not connected. It means, for example, driving a car by following a GPS, which is part of the infosphere anyway. It means being able to download music when you want, if you want. It means being able to stream uh, movies uh, through Netflix and so on. How likely is it that we will give up all this for a life in a small village somewhere away, maybe uh, 
a sort of a intoxication uh, that we need to clean up uh, and uh, get away from uh, all these digital uh, uh, intersections. It's unlikely, it's possible, but there are places where people do these detox moments, but it's a matter of uh, general trends. Now, that does not mean that uh, it will not change in the future. Uh, it's very unlikely that we might be able to predict now what life will be on life in a hundred years. Just think of what someone could have said in 1917 or 18 about the world a century later. They would not have seen the Second World War, atomic, nuclear, uh, bombs exploding, the environmental crisis, etc. So the digital will change, on life will change, but it's here to stay. New skills or uh, old skills upgraded uh, are going to be essential, of course, as in any uh, serious, significant technological revolution. We shouldn't uh, try too hard to import lessons from the past and adapt them to the future. For example, I suspect it might be a mistake to simplify by saying, oh, every kid today should learn how to code. Maybe, maybe not, uh, but it might not be the most important skill that we need for future generations to exercise. More likely, it seems to me, that uh, we will need to learn the languages of information. Coding is one of them, but it's not the only one. It might not even be the most important. For example, music. If you can't read music, there is a whole world that is inaccessible to you. Or design, which is another language. If you can't design, as in designing a video game, for example, what is another job in a whole world that will not be accessible to that particular person? A foreign language, the language of mathematics, the language of statistics, but also the language of history or politics. These are all forms of communication that are not just a matter of gaining information, but above all are ways of uh, being critical about what one learns and able to produce new items out there. So it's not just a matter of, uh, oh, we need to be able to understand, but we need to be able to understand critically and we need to be able to contribute critically to that understanding. Insofar as this is possible, uh, the school has a huge task in front of itself. Education will not be the same, and it certainly will not be about acquiring information. For that, this Wikipedia. <music> Trying to understand initially, maybe in the 90s, what all this digital transformation was going to be about, a lot of people thought that uh, it was uh, an environmental transformation. I remember being told, oh, it's about moving uh, bits rather than atoms. Maybe. Some other people thought it was just more of the same. It was a communication revolution. It was, uh, in a way, the grandchildren of Gutenberg now playing with uh, digital documents as opposed to print and press. Maybe. But the truth seemed to me in the past that uh, it was a deeper transformation, a transformation in our self-understanding, who we are and who we want to be. And that made me realize that uh, we had been there before. In the past, uh, there were three fundamental revolutions in our self-understanding. We thought we were at the center of the universe with Copernicus. That changed dramatically. It changed not just scientifically, but it changed in terms of anthropology, who we think we are, our self-understanding. All of a sudden, we realized that we were on a small planet in the middle of nowhere, going around the sun, going around in a galaxy, and so on. It just diminished our self-importance. We sort of retrenched uh, implicitly and thought, well, at least we can uh, have a royal role, the centrality in the animal kingdom. Uh, now, that was challenged by Darwin. Uh, with the evolution, we realized that we are much more similar to uh, many other animals. We're part of a bigger family. Who is central to what becomes highly questionable. It's more part of the same game uh, that involves you know, many other species. There was a third threshold, a third moment of uh, self-importance, we thought throughout why we were thinking that we were at the center of the universe, why we were thinking that we were at the center of the animal kingdom, we also thought we were at the center of this mental space. There are beautiful pages by great philosophers uh, who describe this as self-awareness. You look inside your mind and you know exactly what's going on and what ideas you have, what ideas you don't have, and in fact, 19th century economists still thought that way. 
The truth is, with Freud, that we have lost their centrality as well. The mind is not like a, a box where you just open the lid and look inside. Uh, there are plenty of uh, hidden areas, uh, dark corners, which we don't know and we don't want to know. The result is that we're not at the centre of the mental life either. As we say, goodness knows why I did what I did in the past. So, as a result, there was a final last area where we thought we were really the, the best in town. We were exceptionally good, like no one else. Playing chess, driving a car, parking their car, or piloting that particular airplane from here to there, or finding the best ticket for that concert online. Well, you can see where we're going here. The truth is that our digital technologies, autonomous, uh, able to learn, able to change uh, their own uh, uh, processing, are better than us often in doing what we thought we were uniquely positioned to do. In other words, the space of intelligent action is no longer the only space for us where we are central. The truth is that today you can achieve what humans would require intelligence to achieve by being totally stupid. The iPhone I play with plays infinitely better chess than I do, and yet he has the intelligence of my grandmother's fridge. The result is that I've been challenged once again. My spatial nature certainly does not lie in being able to play chess contrary to a machine. That's the fourth revolution in our self-understanding. We're not at the centre of the infosphere either. The digital is reshaping our society in ways that uh, at some point we kind of misunderstood. It was very easy only a few years ago to overlap the several divides, for example, between north and south, between rich and poor, between those who live, uh, say, downtown and those who live in suburbia, between those who can use computers and those who cannot, those who have computers and those who don't, the mobile phone, the internet connection and so on. It was almost like too easy to draw a single line. A whole group of people on one side, the other group on the other. That is definitely not true. You can be incredibly able and skilled uh, and live in suburbia. Uh, you may be incredibly dumb and not aware of what's going on and yet uh, be a billionaire. The truth is that the digital is not really overlapping with the usual social device that we have inherited from the past. This is in a way good, in a way bad as everything is a mixed uh, blessing. The good bits is that uh, plenty of opportunities. You don't have to be uh, from that family, from that social class, from that particular corner of town to be good at or exploit or use uh, the digital technology that are available, not necessarily. There are more opportunities for more people all over the place, irrespective of their social background, uh, their uh, wealth, uh, even their education sometimes. The bad news is that, uh, well, we're not quite clear uh, in our minds how exactly this digital divide is going to uh, pan out. We have solutions from the past. Uh, we have been, uh, for example, socially engaged with poverty. But what do you do when there is a uh, digital divide that involves, for example, people who are not poor, who are perfectly happy not to be online, not to join the information society, not to take advantage, say, of uh, the wealth of information available online? We've seen this in politics, for example. It is not true and it's important to realise that those who may be more populist are necessarily the ones who are more aware of what the digital can do for your more informed choices. Sometimes it's a bad use of the uh, digital, sometimes it's no use at all. In that, we have a lot of work to do. Philosophy in general and ethics in particular, which is a branch of philosophy, uh, the branch of philosophy that studies what's right and wrong, uh, what I ought to do, what I ought not to do, uh, what is uh, goodness and what is evil. Well, as I said, philosophy in general and ethics in particular seem to be quite an essential ingredient at a time when we need to understand what's happening. Think for a moment. Uh, this digital revolution is unprecedented. It doesn't mean that we haven't had similarly important revolutions in the past. Someone at some point invented the alphabet. Someone at some point invented the wheel. Well, these are fundamental transformations in human history. Likewise, at some point, we started having 
digital technologies around us. But it does mean that this moment has never been experienced before. Uh, no one has seen the digital emerging and then disappearing and then, oh, well, we can just learn from the past. So lessons need to be learned from scratch, from the very beginning, which means that philosophy and ethics in particular can be of great help, not by themselves, not alone, but contributing to our understanding. Now, this means having a particular un way of looking at philosophy. Uh, what kind of philosophy are we talking about here? Well, there are many ways of describing it, and uh, it's not accidental. Philosophy is the place where we address so-called open questions. Questions are open when uh, you may have all the data in the world, all the information in the world, all the rationality and mathematics and statistics in the world. Be very rational and open-minded about the answer to that question, and yet still disagree. Imagine. Should we or should we not have a party next Saturday? Plenty of information, plenty of reasoning, plenty of maths. Maybe money is involved, maybe there's a social event, etc. And yet, you and I could still disagree about it. Why? Because it ultimately is a philosophical decision. It's a balancing act between the pro and contra, what's right and wrong, what would be better, do we have an alternative, is this the best thing we can do, etc. It's a matter of values, it's a matter of convincing each other. So, when, as we say, all the data in the world, all the information, so-called empirical facts, and all the maths, all the numbers, all the figures, all the statistical calculations, so the maths are insufficient to resolve the problem, well, that problem is open. It's open to a dialogue, a decision, a discussion among human beings. That's where philosophy starts. Some of the philosophy is trivial. Should I wear my hair long or short? Well, it's a philosophical choice. The fact that it's a silly uh, question is irrelevant. So is uh, 2 plus 2 equal 4. It is still a mathematical uh, point, and yet very simple. The point that we normally make is that philosophy addresses the most difficult open questions. Now, back to us. The digital is an extraordinary revolution that poses the most fundamental challenges in terms of open questions. Wouldn't you like to have a philosophy on board in order to address them? <laughs>
in the general election of a big country, say, like the United States, with the fact that they polluted the environment. They transformed an environment where something was unacceptable, unheard of, something that you would have been ruining your intellectual and political career forever into normality. Swearing, lying, saying the opposite or special alternative truths, being able to go online and say, we will never ever form a government with that particular party, and yet only months later getting together and say, oh, that's okay anyway. Well, this is a polluted environment that the social media have enabled us to generate, unfortunately. So remember, it's a drop, and therefore there is more, but it's a drop that ruins the whole bottle of wine. That's why the social media need to be carefully handled. And it's not enough to say, oh, marginally, limited, uh, not often. No, they have to be on the right side of the divide. They need to take a stance and work for democracy. Neutrality is not a stance, it's not a position. It's very hard to imagine a world where social media in other countries, uh, forget now for a moment Europe or the United States or Great Britain uh, in terms of Brexit, but let's consider the rest of uh, the world, maybe Brazil or uh, an African country, say South Africa, or maybe South Korea, the Philippines. Well, it's very hard to imagine that those places will not be equally affected by the wrong handling of social media. So social media have an enormous uh, responsibility and being able to say I'm hiding between that responsibility and a tiny small impact that I might have had on the life of a few million people just for an hour a day, uh, every now and then, that's not good enough. It's hard to identify the biggest challenges that such a growing sector uh, is facing, but maybe a couple of them uh, may be useful to reflect on larger responsibilities. One is um, what relationship we want to have between these uh, digital technologies and the environment. Again, uh, just to be clear, the digital is not replacing uh, the analog, is um, in the best case supporting it, making it more efficient. For example, we fly much more today than we have ever been able in the past, uh, but cheap airlines and uh, economy uh, flights are available also because of digital technologies and efficiency built on that corner of the world. So the digital needs to be a friend of the environment and the environment needs to look at the digital as an ally. How are we going to build this alliance between the green of the environment and the blue of the digital, so this green and blue uh, strategy, is one of the challenges we have today. For example, these enormous companies are often very uh, aware of the impact and uh, they look carefully at uh, the sustainability of their business in terms of buying renewable energy but the renewable energy bought by Google, for example, is not available to someone else. So we need to be uh, a little bit more uh, astute in building this green and blue strategy moving forward. The second point that I would like to highlight is not just uh, environmental sustainability, but social preferability to have another label. In other words, what kind of society do we want to build in which the environment and the digital are friends and at the same time life is worth living? Now, we might have the best technology and the best environment and very miserable uh, lives uh, altogether. So how do we sort of square this particular issue with uh, social standards, lowering inequality, improving living standards elsewhere, not in Europe, not in the United States, but where standards are really uh, horrible? Now, that is the second challenge that seems to me in front of us. And so how we transform this extraordinary development in human intelligence, these digital technologies, into engines for the creation of wealth, and then we use that wealth to help the rest of humanity to have a more decent life, well, that would be a project for the 21st century worthy of our all efforts. Cambridge Analytica has been a very welcome wake-up call. It was well known. Academics uh, like myself have been discussing the Cambridge Analytica problem for almost a couple of years. The truth is that he hadn't hit the fan, so to speak, and he hadn't hit the news. Also, the magnitude of the problem hadn't become clear yet. But the problem originally was quite uh, well known. 
Facebook had uh, allowed uh, an app or several apps, uh, Cambridge Analytica being one of them, uh, to collect information and then information about other people connected to the people about which was collecting information, so secondary uh, profiles and so on, in a way that it was unacceptable. In other words, I was running perhaps an app, I was able to collect your data and then the data of the people connected to you and then do pretty much what I wanted with the data collected. Now this simple but not oversimplistic picture uh, is behind the Cambridge Analytica scandal. A scandal because those data were then used uh, allegedly to influence American elections, Brexit and God knows what else. Now why a welcome sort of wake-up call? Facebook had already changed the rules, had already stopped allowing those apps to collect the data and the data about other people connected to those data. But it hadn't been enough, it had not taken care of alerting the people involved, had not moved forward in restoring the trust, uh, in making sure that nothing wrong would happen. It was a moment of, as long as I do what the law says I should be doing, that's good enough. It's called compliance. Compliance is when uh, you follow the law, and uh, you do exactly what the law and only what the law says you should be doing. Now, in a complex world like digital technology, where things are changing on a daily basis, where trust is essential, where lives of billions, and I mean billions of people, are one click away from your uh, business, well, compliance is certainly not good enough. It's necessary, you have to do it, but it's hugely insufficient. We've seen this with Cambridge Analytica. Facebook probably didn't do anything wrong, legally speaking. And yet, the uh, backlash has been ferocious, and in some sense, rightly so. There was a breach of trust, and Mark Zuckerberg apologized repeatedly in different contexts for it, and again, rightly so. So what can we learn from it? Well, partly that uh, the industry is already a bit ahead of legislation in this case too. Uh, Facebook had already changed its strategy anyway. Partly that uh, a socio-political engagement with these companies is vital. We need to stop thinking that market would take care of it by themselves. There are corners of the world that the markets either don't care for or they cannot care for. And that's where social and political innovation and uh, uh, engagement is vital. And third lesson, even when the markets are effective, we are effective in what way? Well, markets are very good at creating wealth. They are terrible at distributing wealth and are terrible at the sustainable engagement in creating their wealth. So when it comes to creating wealth, let business do what business does best. But when it comes to distributing the advantages and making sure that the ethics is uh, the right thing to do in terms of sustainability and social preferability, that's our task. That's the task of society. Among the several changes that we have witnessed in the last few years, several fashions and several technologies uh, come to mind. Uh, we spoke about big data. We were speaking about cloud computing. We're now talking a lot about artificial intelligence in a variety of ways. The last of these developments is agents, uh, things that do things for you, instead of you, and sometimes better than you, or at least they save you time, effort, efficiency. Now, agents of all kinds might be a little piece of software that maybe cleans up your computer. That's already an agent. Or it might be the uh, little piece of software that makes sure that the fire alarm in your house is uh, constantly running and updated and it's uh, doing a good job. Or it might be the little app that reminds you that uh, there is no milk in the fridge and so on. All these little bots sometimes are also called, little pieces of software uh, that are helping us, you know, everyday life, they come with almost like a too easy uh, not to fall a trap. Because they do things for us instead of us, better than us, and they save us from the tiresome, the boring, the oh I don't want to do it today kind of uh, jobs, well it's very easy to delegate, to make them decide for us instead of us. And so next thing you know, uh, maybe it is your uh, particular little robot in the house that decides when you need to clean the uh, sofa or when you need to clean uh, the carpet. It's your little robot that tells you, well, now is the time to take the car for an MOT or a revision or double checking. 
In other words, we are delegating not just the doing, but also the decision about the doing. Now, that's a big difference. It's one thing to decide that something needs to be done and then delegate an agent, maybe an artificial agent, to do it for you. Like the no, dishwasher. Uh, it really has to be done and it has to be done now. You press the button and you go and maybe read a newspaper or watch Netflix. Another thing is to be told by the dishwasher what you need to do, when you need to do, and maybe you shouldn't you know, make so many dishes so dirty, Luciano, next time. Now, being in the hands of a delegated artificial agents, that's the risk. So, delegation of actions or processes, probably a good idea. Control, decision, strategy. What's going to happen if something goes wrong? What well, should really stand as a warning and should remain in our hands? <laughs>
we might be annoyed by the extra traffic, we might not be very pleased by someone who doesn't accept the rules as anyone else, but most of us just behave and takes a bit of extra time to get where you want. Now, likewise, I hope in the infosphere we will find that uh, our behaviour will have improved because we have a different set of standards, sensitivities, but also different sets of rules, what's right and wrong, and we'll get punished because it's not the right thing to do in that social space. It's almost paradoxical that the same technologies that have brought us together in this small village now called uh, Earth are also the technologies that have made us realise how different we are from each other. So think of the far distant past. It was a big place, this Earth of ours. And what was happening, say, in Japan would not bother anyone in Brazil. And what was happening in Brazil might took you know, maybe days or weeks to reach, uh, say, Portugal. Uh, so it was a big world, it was not connected, and yet the sense of universal values was there because we didn't know better. We thought that anyone was like us anywhere else, simply because we hadn't met each other, so to speak. So bringing us together in a sort of globalized uh, single unity that is uh, this world of ours now, digital technologies have contributed to make us realize that we are also quite diverse from each other. So it's almost a counterbalance by saying, oh look, we're now so much on the same boat and yet we may not like each other that much. Now what's uh, the uh, sort of positive constructive lesson to extract from here? Is it possible to have some general universal rules or legislation or some sort of a framework that puts everybody happy on the same side of the divide? There is a missing factor in this picture. We speak of these big companies as uh, uh, companies that reach every corner of the world for a reason. Uh, whereas a, a single state, a single nation, uh, say France, Italy, Spain, the UK, United States, Canada, have only that sort of geographical reach and sometimes also influence, but they are not certainly global, uh, multinational are called multinational for a reason. They reach everywhere and they may actually have an influence everywhere. So I would expect that if there's any general minimal common denominator in a sort of regulation about life online or on life in the infosphere, it may more easily come from these big companies, which are multinational, rather than national governments that are, by default, local and geographically limited. Now, in all this picture, one more element makes it even more complicated. There are sovereign national entities. Things like Europe uh, and the European Union, or NATO, or organizations uh, the, like the World Economic Forum and so on. Things that uh, uh, put together more agents in a variety of geometries, so to speak, more points joined by different lines. And those can also have a role to play when it comes to a minimum decent standard of regulations that everybody is sufficiently happy with. So multinational, sovereign national organizations, a refinement of our sensitivities all over the place, and some pressure, economic pressure, because nothing like incentives and disincentives make business change its mind. Mm -hmm.